Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Fast and Reliable Gene Synthesis for Optimized Protein Expression. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit thermofisher.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Claudia Chiochini, staff scientist in R&D at Thermo Fisher Scientific. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Claudia, you may now begin your presentation. Good morning and good afternoon to all attendees, and thank you for taking the time to join this webinar today. And before I start with the presentation, I'd like to mention what is the mission of Thermo Fisher Scientific which is to enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. And this is a mission we are particularly proud of today in these difficult times of a global pandemic in which Thermo Fisher is helping by developing accurate diagnostic tools and supporting our customers in developing new therapeutic approaches and hopefully very soon new effective vaccines against COVID-19. For example, from Gene Art Thermo Fisher, we've been sending along this year thousands of genes for designated for vaccine development. Okay, here is the agenda for today's webinar. I will start introducing gene synthesis, how it works, and how it can facilitate your discovery workflow. I will then explain what gene optimization is and why it is key for a successful gene expression and ultimately for increasing protein production. I will describe how to effectively join biosynthetic DNA pieces to build larger constructs. And in particular, we will take a look at experimental data obtained when combining strings DNA fragments and GeneArt Gibson assembly technology. In the second part of the webinar, I will focus on protein production especially on how to boost protein production by using advanced tools already available for you in the market and combining it with our expertise in producing protein. And finally, we will see how to go from digital sequence to purified protein using our gene to protein service, which gives you access to your desired protein in the amount and quality you need, so you can save time and concentrate on your actual research. Synthetic biology is very powerful and is connected to many other disciplines. It supports basic research, but also industrial research, for example, through acceleration of drug discovery. It is key for new therapeutic approaches like cell therapy or gene therapy, for the production of new antibodies, for example, for the fight against cancer. Of course, it is possible through synthetic biology to develop new biotechnologies and it is also the base for personalized medicine approaches where, based on the knowledge of the DNA of the patient, you can um, basically find new tailored solutions for, um, for many diseases. And hopefully, as we will see very soon for COVID-19, synthetic biology also enables to develop safe new vaccines. And of course, you can think of synthetic biology as something which goes beyond life science. One example might be data storage in DNA. So the real power of synthetic biology is that it really gives you access to any gene and any protein you want, regardless the origin and complexity of these. 
And it doesn't matter for which purpose you need a protein. Maybe you need a single protein to study structure or function, or you are in the middle of the screening process where you're searching for the right candidates. In all these approaches, you can start and design proteins from scratch. And all you need is an electronic sequence. So you can have access to this uh, entire uh, workflow just starting with an amino acid sequence or a DNA sequence. And what it comes next is that the sequence is optimized. And I will talk more extensively about gene optimization. After gene optimization, then we can really form a physical DNA template. And this is the gene synthesis step. And what normally happens next is that the gene of interest can be subcloned into a vector and used for your own application to produce plasmid, or it can use as a master gene to produce gene variants. Of course, we are also able to produce entire gene libraries. And what happens next with plasmid preparation, normally researchers do a transformation of E. coli, or they transfect cell lines, mammalian cells for protein production. So this is just an example of what your discovery workflow might look like. And what I want to really focus on today are three aspects, gene optimization, gene synthesis, and protein expression from mammalian cells. You can think of this workflow like something we can support you with, and you can either outsource the entire workflow or just ask us to support you in taking over part of this workflow to accelerate your research. Here at Thermo Fisher, we are considered experts in writing DNA. And with writing DNA, I mean really synthesizing DNA from scratch. In this process, it is crucial to adapt the DNA to your host organism. When we talk about heterologous gene expression, everyone understands the importance of the current usage. Since the genetic code is, yes, universal, but it is degenerated so that amino acid can be coded by different codons. And we know that the frequency with which codons are picked is different from in each and every organism. And this correlates with the amount of transfer RNA present in the cell. So it is understandable that current usage influences, in the first place, the efficiency of the translation and, uh, process. But there are other factors which really play a very important role. And these are connected to the structural property of the RNA. I think of GC content or the presence of cryptic splice sites, direct repeats, RNA secondary structures, and any elements causing instability of the sequence. So all these factors play really a role and can hamper protein expression. So the gene optimizer technology was developed at GeneArt by our RT team. And this takes into consideration 20 different parameters to optimize DNA for expression in mammalian cells. And just to uh, make you clear that this is a very um, complex process, you can take a look at this. This is an hypothetical DNA sequence or your wild-type gene on the uh, left side of this slide. And this wild-type sequence might contain unfavorable codons, which are underlined in red, and more favorable codons, which are underlined in green. And now, if you imagine to replace all the red columns by the green columns, this would be a quite easy process. But this is a simple back translation. So you don't need really a complicated algorithm to do this operation. And this would not reach the goal, which is to really optimize your gene for expression in your host. So the goal is to find a trade-off between the current usage and the presence, in this case, the absence of those unwanted motives which I was listing before. And this is what gene optimizer technology is doing. And what this algorithm does is that it considers all possible codon combination, but not in the entire gene sequence, but it takes a small window of 10 to 20 amino acids. And in this small window, it checks all possible codon combinations according to the codon adaptation index. And what happens is that when the first optimal codon is found, this is locked down, and this, the window slides from 5 prime to 3 prime, and the process is repeated over and over. A second window is also considered to evaluate the current combination. And as I was mentioning before, gene optimizer really pays attention that 
these unwanted motives are not introduced so that protein expression is not hampered. So this is more or less the principle with which uh, our technology works. Um, but I have also to, to say that you know, optimizer algorithm works twofold. So on the one hand, we have the optimization for maximal protein expression. And on the other hand, we want to minimize the complexity of the DNA sequence, which is fundamental to have a successful gene assembly and really to minimize also the effort for us as a manufacturer. So, and to increase, of course, the probability that your sequence is immediately 100% correct. So the next step after gene optimization is to break up the gene sequence into oligonucleotides. And this is not a trivial process. So we speak here about intelligent oligo design. And the oligos are, of course, partially overlapping. And they are designed in a way that they hybridize to one another and they go together only in the right order. What you see here is a picture of our manufacturing department. And of course, we synthesize oligos in large scale, but we've been optimizing the process over the past years to reduce the scale and to really be able to synthesize oligo of great quality with a high throughput process enabling us now to synthesize over 30,000 oligos per run per day. So what happened next after oligosynthesis is that the oligos are assembled in a gene assembly reaction. And this is kind of similar to a PCR. From the 3' OH, the DNA is extended, and the process is done iteratively so that the full-length gene is formed. And this is then inserted into our standard production vector or a customer vector, if possible. And what happens next is that the plasmid is then transferred into cells, into bacterial cells, by transformation. This is fundamental not only to get enough plasmid DNA. Of course, we need then to analyze the single colonies, to screen them, and then grow a bacterial culture. But it's also fundamental to isolate single plasmid and um, make possible that your plasmid preparation is monoclonal. So after colony screening, a plasmid preparation is done and the plasmid is analyzed by next generation sequencing. Also here, we are really increasing our sequencing capacity over the past year so that now we are able to do 29,000 reads per day. And after we make sure that the, the sequence is 100% correct, the DNA is dried, packaged, and then sent to, to the customer along with final documentation. Normally, using standard gene synthesis, um, you can really quickly have access to your DNA, and you can also request an additional subcloning step so that we transfer your DNA or gene of interest into, for example, an expression vector. So if you go for the standard gene synthesis, you can pick one of the over 150 in vitro gene expression vectors. And this service is uh, available in just a few days. But if you're interested in really fast cloning, then you, you, order, you can order our express cloning. And in this case, you can have access to one of the nine in vitro gene expression vectors listed here. And in some cases, for some eligible customer, we are able to take your vector, readapt it to our manufacturing strategy, and then do directly the cloning experiment into your uh, wish vector. You will now see a polling question appear on your screen. Your participation is greatly appreciated. All right. So what I also wanted to mention is the standard gene synthesis service will give you access to a few micrograms of DNA. It's normally five micrograms of DNA which are delivered to, to the user, but we can increase this quantity and scale up to 20 milligram. You can choose different, vector, uh, different uh, vectors, of course, as I was saying, but you can also choose different buffers to do the plasmid preparation, like trees, water, or PBS. And of course, you have the option to choose between tubes and plates. And we have additional um, services like fill and finish service where we can aliquot the DNA in a small aliquot labeled for your direct use. 
Uh, other options are to order TSC-free production or a low level of endotoxin. This is crucial to many researchers doing, uh, as a downstream application, transfection of mammalian cells. So um, we talked a lot about gene synthesis now, and gene synthesis is, of course, um, the most uh, easy way, I would say, the, to get access to your DNA because you, you don't need to do any step in the lab. But there is also another option that is uh, really very used by uh, researchers, especially in, uh, in the academia. And this is um, the option to order strings DNA fragments. Strings DNA fragments are double-stranded DNA. They are done exactly using the same mechanism as for gene synthesis. So it starts with a bioinformatics step, gene optimization, oligosynthesis and assembly. And the only difference is that the cloning step is skipped. So uh, what we normally do is bulk sequencing of this synthetic DNA, like sequencing of a PCR product, and then measuring of the DNA concentration, and then just dry the DNA and send it along with the final documentation. So meaning that there is no downstream service. Normally, this um, we deliver at least 200 nanogram of DNA, but the quantity, the average quantity which we ship is 900 nanograms. And this service is doable for DNA in a length comprised between 150 base pairs and 3,000 base pairs. So the practical thing of string is that they are not only convenient, but they come really fast in as few as three business days for the uh, the easy and short version. And what you have to do is, if you want to have access to your clone, is just you need to take strings, clone it in the vector of interest, and then do the screening process. So pick colony, do the screening and sequencing. So this is what uh, makes the product a bit cheaper compared to gene synthesis, but it's still a great quality. OK, so I think we have a second round of questions here. You will now see a polling question appear on your screen. Your participation is greatly appreciated. So, all right, so genome strings um, are really a convenient solution to get access to your synthetic DNA. And we know that many researchers are used to order genome strings, even if they need something larger. So what they do is they combine genome strings together into a larger construct. And if you're interested in doing that, I strongly recommend to use Gina Gibson assembly. And I mean, there are many, many tools that Thermo Fisher makes available to you to clone DNA. As examples which are very well known in any lab are topo cloning, gateway cloning, these are very efficient systems, and they are ideal in case of, I would say, a single fragment. But when it comes to assembly of many fragments, it really makes sense to look at uh, a technology um, which is efficient, fast, and, and enables you to really clone these pieces totally scarless, and, or as we can say, seamlessly. And this is the reason why General Gibson assembly is a perfect solution in this case. And what I want to highlight next is that, okay, Gibson is a method which is um, really out there since a long time. And uh, the beauty of this system is that you don't need any additional restriction size to add to your insert. All what you, what you need to do is make sure that you have small uh, homologous region the short regions are between 20 and 40 base pairs, in common to the fragments you want to join. And in this picture, these homology regions are highlighted in colors. And only by using those homology regions in your fragments and the Gibson assembly kit, you get final product where you have absolutely no scars and um, a covalently bound molecule. So, the last, um, uh, last year, we've been developing kits here at Gene, at Gene Art Thermo Fisher, 
And the principle is exactly the same principle as in any Gibson assembly technology. So the mix contains a cocktail of enzymes working contemporarily. So we have an exonuclease chewing back homologous ends, a DNA polymerase filling the gaps starting from the 3 OH3, and then a DNA ligase which seals the DNA mix. And the beauty of this is that your um, final product is totally covalently bound, and it is suitable to be transformed into heat competent cells, but also into electrocompetent cells. And this is something which is really important when you build large DNA, since electroporation is much more efficient compared to uh, heat shock. So the two options we can offer are a Junior Gibson Assembly Hi-Fi kit and the EX kit. Hi-Fi, I would say, is the perfect solution for assembly up to, of up to six fragments. It's a single-step reaction. It's an isothermical reaction, and it really gives very high performance, high cloning efficiency. And it also has an interesting application, which I will uh, go through in one minute. And regarding the EX kit, this is the most robust kit. And it's a two-step format, and it's suitable not only for simple cloning experiments, but also for cloning of up to 15 fragments. And it also delivers a very high cloning efficiency, up to 95%. So both are available as a single master mix or combined with competent cells as a kit. And in the next couple of slides, I want to show you the results we got by using those kits in our lab to join DNA fragments. And in this experiment, for example, we've been using two KB inserts, and we could join four pieces into PCDNA 3.4 vector. Those DNA segments were sharing an homology region of about 30 base pairs. And what we did after transformation of electrocompetent cells, we picked colonies and then analyzed them by colony PCR, where we detected the transition region between first and second fragment, which is here on the gel, and third and fourth fragment, again, here, analyzed on the gel at phrases. And what we calculated is the cloning efficiency as the number of colonies carrying the full length, so both PCR combination, over the number of colonies which we analyzed. We did three independent experiments, and as you see here, only in the first experiment we got 100% cloning efficiency, and in three separated experiments we got an average cloning efficiency of 96%. So I think this is a really good result for an 8KB fragment. Hi-Fi kit is really interesting because it can be used also to join fragments which originally do not share any homologous region. And this can be really interesting in many cases. For example, if you, you want to have access to a fragment which is tricky to amplify by PCR because it's complex or too large, you can just cut it and then make it compatible to your vector using stitching oligonucleotides. So using basically single-strand DNA functioning as a bridge between your wanted fragment and the target vector. And you can use this technology even to assemble pieces. So in this example, we joined two fragments which were not shared in homology um, with three different oligonucleotides working as a bridge. Another example can be if you need to introduce the same GNR strings which you ordered into different vectors. So you don't need to reorder strings every time you change vector. You can even shuffle fragment with this technique and so on. And since we weren't 100% sure that we were picking the right oligo concentration, we tried this experiment in a pretty bright range of oligo concentration. And as you can see, we got the optimal cloning efficiency using 30 to 45 nanomolar of oligos. But we still obtain a decent result even using much less and much more oligos, meaning that the technology is really very robust. Um, in the next two slides, I'd like to take a look at the performance of the EX kit. This is the one which we absolutely recommend when you're joining many pieces together. In this experiment, we were joining 0.5 KB DNA fragments or strings, and 
we were comparing the performance of the Gibson assembly with our own GNR seamless cloning kit. Uh, as you can see in this picture, where we're, we're using uh, top 10 heat component cells, both kits were doing very good with six fragments, but the performance of the GNR seamless cloning is going down when we pick eight and 10 fragments. On the other hand, the GNR Gibson assembly EX is very stable, really providing high cloning efficiency even with 10 pieces. And when we used the latrupuration, we got even higher cloning efficiency, up to even 90% with 10 fragments, which was kind of expected since, as I mentioned before, latrupuration is the, really the method of choice when you're doing more complex experiments. And here, of course, we were not comparing with the Gina Simmons cloning kit since, in this case, this kit is not suitable with, uh, to, to be used with latrupuration. So, with this, I'd like to um, quickly wrap up what we said about the Gibson technology. So the combination GNR strings DNA fragments and GNR Gibson technology is a very convenient and fast way to build large constructs. You have full design flexibility because you can pick any vector you want, and this is a clear advantage compared to other techniques like topo cloning or gateway cloning where you are restricted to the use of the vectors which are linked to those kits. So you have also full design flexibility. You can join multiple fragments and many small fragments or even a few large fragments. So you can design the experiment really the way you want. And of course, you have access to the gene art optimization technology so you can optimize the sequence or, of your GNR strings in, in a way that they are perfect for expression in your final etherol exhaust. And if you are interested in those kits and you want to understand more about how to set up the reaction and all about the tips and tricks, I recommend you to take a look at the white papers at the thermofisher.com Gibson assembly page. I think we have again polling here. You will now see a polling question appear on your screen. Your participation is greatly appreciated. Now I'd like to move to the second part of the webinar, which is about writing proteins. And with this, I mean synthesizing protein de novo, starting from an amino acid sequence. So like in case of the gene synthesis workflow, which we were looking at before, also in case of the protein workflow, you can decide whether to take advantage of our expertise in protein manufacturing and let us perform the entire process. Or if you prefer, just can, uh, you can let us take over only parts of this workflow, so the, the tedious or time-consuming parts. So here at Thermo Fisher Gene Art, we have the expertise in doing protein synthesis in eukaryotic cells, and in particular in mammalian cells and insect cells. And the reason for this is that even though we know that many scientists are still, use e. coli, uh, still using E. coli for protein expression, since um, E. coli is cheap and fast growing and its genetic is perfectly characterized. We also know that there are several drawbacks in using E. coli when expressing proteins of eukaryotic origin. And the reasons are that in E. coli it's not possible to make post-translational modifications such as phosphorylation or O and N glycosylation. For example, N glycosylation is fundamental to produce functional antibodies. There are also limitations in the size of the protein that you can produce. And Especially for membrane proteins, for example, the missing environment really do not favor um, the right expression of those proteins. And also many other proteins do not fold correctly and they form inclusion bodies so that the protein cannot be redissolved and obtained in a functional, in a functional way. So for this reason, it is preferable to express eukaryotic protein in eukaryotic cells. And also, I have to say, many of our customers of biotech and pharma, they do um, research with 
mammalian cells for many reasons, also for vaccine de development, human therapy, and diagnostics. So when we're talking about autologous expression, so expression of mammalian genes in mammalian cells, one might ask the question, why should we optimize the gene for expression? And the reason is simple, is that many proteins are not meant to be expressed at a high level in the cells, since nature do not optimize protein for maximal expression, but rather for optimal regulation. So another reason is, of course, that by optimizing genes, we can get rid of all motives that can hamper expression and reduce, at the end, the yield of the protein. So examples can be premature polyadenylation, presence of alternative splice inside, mRNA destabilization, and any element causing transcription, transcriptional silencing. So to prove the efficiency of our mammalian gene optimization algorithm, our R&D scientists did a few years ago a study which was published uh, selecting 50 proteins belonging to the most studied protein classes. These were including protein kinases, transcriptional factors, ribosomal proteins, cytokines, and membrane proteins. Each gene was synthesized in two versions, so as a wild type and as an optimized gene for expression in mammalian cells. And after gene synthesis and cloning, HEC293 cells were transfected in triplicates to minimize the variance. And then protein yield obtained from wild type and from optimized gene were just compared. And what you see in this picture here is a Western blot analysis of the resulting proteins. And the output was very positive. So in 86% of the cases, the optimized genes overperformed the wild type genes. And in 96% of the cases, the optimized gene resulted in at least equal protein levels compared to the wild type. So it seems that gene optimization is, is really um, an advantage and increases protein expression. So what we did next is that we pressure tested again a gene optimizer technology by comparing it with um, analog technologies offered by our competitors. And for this purpose, a selection of protein kinases were, uh, was taken. Also in this case, optimized genes delivered more protein compared to the wild type. And the best result we got it was a 27-fold increase. On the contrary, in case of competitor methods, they failed, at least in one example, to provide better yields compared to the wild type. So in conclusion, it seems that with gene art, gene optimization, algorithm for mammalian cells, we have a very good tool in our hands to increase protein production. So in the next slide, I want to I want to show you how to combine gene art gene optimization with two other Thermo Fisher tools available for you in the market to really boost protein expression. So I'm talking about GIPCO reagents and culture media and XP293 and XP Cho cell lines. So the GIPCO media was developed to enable cells to grow at a three times higher density compared to standard media. And XP293 and XPCHO are optimized to grow at high density and produce more protein per cell. So just as an example, XP293 can be transfected at a density of 3 million cells per milliliter, and XPCHO at a density of 6 million cells per milliliter. So those two products are available in a kit along with a highly efficient transfection reagent, which reliably delivers your clone DNA into the cells. So now it is understandable that the effect is even improved when, the, uh, when those high-performance systems are, are combined with our gene art gene optimization method. So basically, when we transfect the cells with mammalian-optimized clone DNA. And this provides a protein yield increase of three to tenfold. All right, so using those tools, it is very likely you to obtain the same results we would obtain in our laboratory when doing protein manufacturing. 
However, there are many benefits in using our gene to protein service. So the service has the advantage to offer to you a full design flexibility. So you can select any of the vector present in our, in our list on the homepage, so more than 115 vitrogen vectors, or you can send us your own vector established in your lab. You can choose among SP293, XP Cho mammalian system, and also SF9 insect cells combined with a buccal virus expression system. You can decide the scale of your experiment, the purification method, and of course you can request a customized protein analysis. So, and what is really uh, important to say is that everything comes from one hand. So there is no need to transfer material or information from one side to the other because everything is done in-house at our site. So concerning um, protein purification and, and concerning the scale, I will uh, just talk about it in the next two slides. So I want to concentrate now on analysis. And um, at the beginning, when this ser service was offered, we were able to provide you a standard analysis such as STS page or Western blot and chemo sustaining, and of course, the measurement of the protein amount. But now we are able to, um, to also fulfill other requests. So you can request capillary electrophoresis to determine the degree of purity of your protein or HPLC chromatography to determine the monomeric state of your antibody, for example, or even mass spectrometry analysis to check the efficiency of the glycosylation for your antibody. So there's plenty of possibility to really customize this service. Concerning the cells, as I was saying before, so the choices between mammalian cells and insect cells, and but I have to say that XP293 and XP Cho systems they are the preferred system from uh, the researchers ordering our gene to protein service. Capacity is constantly growing, so um, in terms of scale, we are really very, very flexible. So last year, there was a, a new product which was launched, and this is the small scale protein service. This is really suitable to customers doing, for, for example, high throughput screening experiment. So researchers who do not need high amounts of protein, but they need many proteins at once. So in this small scale service, we offer 24 to 96 multi-well expression. Of course, there is also the possibility to go up with the scale and have a suspension culture in 30 milliliter or 25 liter. And concerning capacity, this is, as I was saying, constantly increasing. So currently, we can do 300 liter suspension culture cell per week and additionally 100 liter in bioreactor culture. So um, regarding protein purification, as I was saying before, this is also totally customizable, so adaptable to your, to your use. Many researchers are interested in antibodies, and I think that more than 80% of the protein we purify daily are antibodies, but of course we are able to produce non-antibody proteins as well. So you can pick any of the affinity tags normally used in the lab, like his tag, strep tag, flag, or C tag. And <clears throat> regarding purification, there is also the possibility to go for different procedures. It can be customized uh, using different protocols, which you normally uh, take in your lab, different resins or buffers. But the standard process is to start with an affinity chromatography, like kind of enrichment step, then switch to ion exchange chromatography, and then close with a size exclusion chromatography, which is the final polishing step. So this is just a hypothetical way to purify your protein. And of course, there are also additional options, like getting rid of the tag using protease cleavage, or uh, using our, again, fill and finish service, aliquoting the protein so that it is ready for your downstream application, or um, even adjusting concentration if you need, and so on. All right, so I think we have again a quick break here. You will now see a polling question appear on your screen. Your participation is greatly appreciated.
Okay, so I, I'd like to spend the last few minutes to go even one step further and describe you the possibility to go not only from gene to, to protein, but also from gene to structure. So we know that a lot of researchers are interested in resolving the structure of the protein. And X-ray crystallography is, of course, very, very powerful and has been improved in the past years. But it's, there are still bottlenecks in using these technologies. If one thinks of um, crystallization of membrane proteins or large complexes like in the ribosome and so forth. So for, for these cases, um, cryo-electromicroscopy is, is really um, a valid option. And cryo-M is so fast that you can get your protein structures really in a few weeks instead of a few months. So if you start barely with an electronic sequence, you can get your DNA in two weeks using our service. Then three additional weeks to do um, transaction of the cell line, purification, and then finally you can use cryoEM if you access to this technology to produce your protein structure. And we did a simple feasibility study using protein P97, which is an RTPase, and used the workflow I was highlighting before using our gene optimization, gene synthesis, protein purification, and then after freezing the protein using basically bringing it to cryoscopic temperature. Uh, what happened next is that in cryoEM, electrons are fired at copies of frozen molecules and an electron deflection is recorded by detectors, and with a complex software, the images can be stitched together in the two-dimensional and then 3D classes, and this is really an exciting process, which is getting better and better. And there is, a, I think, a recent publication uh, pointing out that researchers were able to use cryoEM to get a resolution of 1.25 angstroms, which is just amazing, because it means that uh, we are now able to redefine the position of individual atoms. So in our experiment, we were able to determine the structure of P97, also in presence of the substrate, which is ATP. And you can imagine, like for X-ray crystallography, to use this technique to crystallize your protein in, presence, in the presence of the relative substrate or antagonist or anything. So I think this is an exciting um, further development of protein structure determination and it's of course something we're looking into to be maybe able soon to offer to you a gene to structure um, service. I've been talking in detail about gene synthesis and protein synthesis services and products from Thermo Fisher Scientific and I would like to mention an additional advantage over alternative providers which is our customer support network. So we assist customers through our customer care group, our technical sales specialists, and our global technical support, with more than 200 scientists located at 18 different sites around the globe. And now I'd like to wrap up. The key takeaways of this webinar are that gene synthesis is a cornerstone for synthetic biology and enables to produce genes from scratch giving access to any sequence regardless its origin or complexity. Gene optimization is a complex process which is key to obtain successful gene expression in heterologous as uh, in autologous hosts. Constructing large DNA is simple and convenient if you use GNR strings combined with GNR Gibson assembly kit. And this is ideal to construct larger genes or even entire pathways. And finally, the recipe to obtain high protein yield is to combine gene, gene optimization technology with advanced expression systems such as XP293 and XP2, which are the highest titer systems in the market. So if you want to partner with Thermo Fisher to accelerate your research, you can reach out to us using your local sales representative or visit thermofisher.com slash genart. And of course, you can reach out to our customer care team by sending an email at genartsupport at thermofisher.com. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to taking your questions. 
Thank you, Claudia, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Our first question is, what is the longest gene you can synthesize? All right, this is very much dependent on complexity of the DNA. So if you go for the standard gene synthesis service, we are able to um, synthesize with no problem DNA up to 12 KB. But of course, we are also able to synthesize larger DNA since we have a special manufacturing team here at the site, which is really dedicated to uh, the synthesis of more complex DNA. So if you are interested in larger DNA, you can just reach out to our customer care team and discuss with us the project, and I'm sure we can, um, we can provide you with a complex and large DNA as well. Okay, thank you, Claudia. Our second question here is, how many different host systems can you optimize for? Okay, Gene, gene Optimizer can do optimization for at least 200 different hosts. What you will find in our portal and in the Instant Designer or Strings Assistant, if you're ordering Gene of Strings, are the top 40 organisms which are selected normally by researchers for gene optimization. Again, if you don't find your ideal organisms in this selection, you can contact us and I'm pretty sure we can satisfy your request. When cloning strings, how many colonies do I need to pick to find an error-free clone? Um, this is dependent on the length of the string, I would say. So if you, if you have a, a string which is comprised between 150 bits per and I would say 1.5, it's really enough to pick two clones. If you are uh, doing screen for a, a strings up to 3 KB, it's probably enough to select four clones. So it, it is really simple, uh, the screening process, since we use um, uh, error, an error correction mechanism, um, an enzymatic error correction, which really reduce the oligo errors, um, which are common after gene synthesis, so that the screening as for F4 is really very reduced for you as a customer. Okay, our next question is, do I need to pick more colonies if my string lengths are longer? Yes, I, I would recommend to go for, I would say four to maximum six colonies if you have a three KB large string. And as I said, our error correction mechanism really improves the correctness of the gene, and it reduces extremely the, the presence of errors in the DNA. So it is really safe to pick four to six colonies for large strings. Okay, thank you. I've got another question. How do I know if I should build my DNA as a string or a clone? Yes, this is uh, this is simple. If you use our strings, general string assistant, for example, and this is something we've really been improving in the past years because at the beginning the customer was just having the message we are not able to synthesize your sequence as a string. So now it, it really improved a lot because we we say why eventually we're not able to synthesize it as a string, and we offer to you the chance to change the sequence. Often we have to do with open reading frames, so we can use the degenerative code to, of course, optimize the sequence for also for making it less complex. And so what, what you have to do is just to agree to the changes we, we ask you to consider, and then the, the sequence can become eligible. And if it's still not producible as a string, then you will get a message that we can synthesize this as a clone gene, so you should just order it as a standard gene synthesis. Okay, our next question is, are there any limitations to using my own vector for cloning? Actually, no, because you can uh, request subcloning in any vector you want, and this is just a simple additional step of, after gene synthesis. And the other possibility, as I was 
mentioned before, there are eligible customers who, re who really order a lot of DNA and uh, or very frequently in the same construct. And what we can do is that we can modify this vector for your own use. We can modify it in a way that we adapt it to our manufacturing procedure. And express cloning can be possible also in your vector, if you like. OK, thank you, Claudia. It looks like we have time for one more question. Can I order a protein quantity as opposed to a scale? This is possible. It is possible, but to um, be sure we can deliver the amount of protein you need, we need to do a pilot test. So we would do a quick pilot just to see how much protein is normally produced using our cell lines. And then, of course, you'll get informed. And if everything looks fine, then we can do the production of your requested amount. Thank you, Claudia. Um, thank you again for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.